Hello there and welcome to Complete Games and the beginning of a new set of videos from myself. This time round we will be completing Ark and all of its DLC alongside some friends and Discord members to form the Complete Crew. From time to time I'll be dropping in with the odd update video to share the progress we're making but in a shorter more condensed video format. We start by spawning in on Island South 1 and of course naked and as a level 1 beach bob we immediately begin the process of punching trees to make some of our primitive items. Next as other members start to spawn in we all tribe up so we get that shared XP bonus and it doesn't take us long to get through some of the basic levels. Having gathered enough berries and making a few trank arrows, myself and Romeo head out to take on this level 30 trike. It shouldn't take too much to knock it out between us and of course we will have a way of gathering berries. And one minute into the video you can see we've already got our first berry picking dinosaur. Next, Vexing Cat heads out on the raft to gather some crystal and metal and while they're doing that I figured I'd go and head out and get Helena Note 7 just to get an extra couple of levels. Of course to take full advantage of this XP bonus I head along the beach killing all of the Lystros and Dodos I can find. I spot a Lystro up ahead in front of Shiny Bee and I was unaware she was trying to tame it. I'm um, sorry, I've... <laughs> I've... I've tried... Well, I may as well kill it now. Sorry, I didn't... It didn't show me that anything was coming up to tame it. And I was just like... I've just grabbed that XP thing, so I need to kill something. Not much to report as we approach night two on the island map. A Tyrannodon lands in front of me that's a level 85, so I decided to grab it. It might prove to be of use later on, just to get us started. The trike that we managed to tame earlier has been called Magic Mike, and that is officially the first dino that the tribe managed to tame together. So I just use Magic Mike to keep on gathering some more berries and thatch and wood as we wait for Vexing Cat and the rest of the crew to return on the raft. So it's around mid-afternoon on the second day of the island map that Vex and the rest of the tribe return with that essential crystal and metal we need at least to get us started with a spyglass, metal pick and hatchet. It's then that the tribe decide to start and move our base location off of this beach and they've decided to build on Weathertop. Now in spite of my most viewed video on YouTube being the best locations to build on the island map, the whole tribe decides to go with one that didn't even get an honourable mention. But I will admit that Weathertop is a prime location for an alpha tribe and that's what we are so we're heading over to Weathertop. So as we shift on up to Weathertop, I spot a 150 tech Parasaur. I was going to kill it because we needed the metal and components, but my tribe mates assured me that it might be of use later on, or at least in the beginning. So I'm instructed to tame this one. And after taming a Parasaur, a few of us are starting to get some basic tames and knock out a few creatures around the top. We need to get some base foundations down, so I head on up towards what Sven's building, and I assumed was some sort of taming pen. It turns out that this was going to be the tribe base location, so we immediately kick Sven off building and stick Diva on it. And Diva also managed to drop a max level pterodon, so I begin mating that with the pterodon that we knocked out on the beach earlier on and we called this one Terry. Later on into the evening of day three on the island map and we're already starting the process of breeding. With the pterodon myself and Diva's core we're able to get a few eggs together and also the base is starting to come together. The following morning and a red sun arises and myself, Vex and Boss Chunk all head out on the raft to gather some more metal and crystal. This time we're heading out a bit further 
and we're ensuring to stay near the coastline. Of course, the island map has Lee Thictus, so it's always better to keep your raft closer to the coastline. We eventually reach the location we're looking for. There's plenty of metal and crystal on the top of this hill, and I come up with an ingenious way of being able to roll the metal down the hill. However, Vex thinks it might be better to tame something to carry everything down the hill, and we spot a 145 trike. Unfortunately, we end up aggroing all of the trikes around it, and I was pretty sure that we was going to be safe up the top of this rock. Ah, that surprised me. <laughs> oh, there's another one. There's another one. There's three. Who told us to grab this trike? Who wanted this? After a couple of failed attempts, me and Vex managed to trank out this 145 trike and it turns out to be a female, so we end up naming it Mrs. Chips after what Shiny was eating at the time. And I'm sure Magic Mike is going to be very happy with Mrs. Chips when we get back to base. And the trike does prove to be very useful in gathering the rest of the resources we need before we head on back. We arrive back with no hiccups under the cover of darkness, with the forges full of metal and crystal. By the time we arrive back at base we can already see the rest of the crew have managed to get quite a lot done. We've got some veggies growing and they've even managed to make a fabricator. They've tamed up some carnos and we've even got various creatures breeding. So quite a lot of been progress being made in our first evening on the complete island mission. One of the next bottlenecks appears to be polymer. We do need to make some cryopods, so in order to get some polymer efficiently, we really need to get some fur gear together. So I go out and kill some megaloceros in order to get some easy fur together. When I got back to the base with what pelt I'd managed to get from the megaloceros, I was able to make most of the armor that I would need to go into the north biome. A few of the tribe members gathered together in order to cut their hair, so I was able to make a complete set of fur armor. I took the pterodon north of the blue obelisk just to kill some penguins, and I bought a club with me so we was able to get plenty of polymer, at least enough to be able to get us started. When I returned to base with the organic polymer that I'd gathered in the north, I found that disaster had struck. Benny had in fact tamed a Pegomastix, and it got worse because when I went inside, I see that Shiny had finally broke. Perhaps it was the Lustrosaurus I killed on the beach earlier on, but in front of my eyes, she snapped and begun to shave her head. The tribe was clearly taking a severe step backwards in my absence and they were beginning to break under the pressure. The good news was I was able to craft some cryopods and make a few sets of ghillie armor and Vexing Cat said she spotted a good looking Quetzal out towards the volcano. I couldn't witness this madness anymore back at the base so we decided to try and do something positive for the tribe. Vex then made a shout to tame a tech quetzal she'd spotted out towards the redwoods. Seeing that the hope of my fellow tribe mates had almost been fully depleted, we teamed up on an impossible mission to tame and find the rarest and stealth-like of birds the island map has to offer. As you can see from the colours of this prime specimen, it wouldn't fail to boost the morale of any new tribe mate, but we had to tame it first. It took quite a few attempts and we had to steer it away from the mountains and rivers, but we eventually managed to trank it above the redwoods. Once we was able to knock out the creature, we then had to clear out any of the creatures that might aggro on it. I also decided to build a thatch wall just round the outside of our tame. Sometimes when you are out in the redwoods, things like terror birds can come running at you, and it's quite easy to lose a tame. We returned back to our base on Weathertop, victorious in our efforts to tame the elusive Tech Quetzal. Word has spread amongst the tribe and our efforts have gave hope to the broken. Progress. The development towards a more advanced condition. Gains. Growth. Headway. Improvements. 
all things that have been made in my absence, but much more must be achieved if the complete crew is to be successful in its efforts to defeat the Overseer. My tribe mates have tamed a second Tech Quetzal, and as I've always said, the key to beating Ark is in breeding. Today's adventure begins as it always does, with the acquisition of raw materials. Tribe mate Chunk is gathering wood on the mammoth, and I give him a helping hand. Since the mammoth had its TLC update, removing the most unique and characteristic features that were adored throughout the art community. Old, unloved and replaced with a newer model. Like a flower that's withered only to be tossed in the bin after it dies. So too did our beloved mammoth. But Wildcard takes and gives and this new butless mammoth has the ability to harvest wood or berries, making the tried and tested Quetzal and Mammoth team up redundant. When Chunk and I discovered that this old method was no longer as effective, we returned to base. I got him stuck on top of the behemoth gate. I can't get him off. I literally, I can't get him off. <laughs> Having failed in my efforts to help my tribe mate gather more wood, I left him on top of the behemoth gate to bang his drum, and we turned our attention to metal gathering. Next, we grab our new Argentavis, Chonking Cat, the illegitimate child of both Chonk and Vex. Of course, when they said I could borrow their Argentavises, I don't think they meant that way. We also grab Union James, the new acquired Tech Quetzal, and head on up to the volcano. We gather metal, and more, and more, and more, and more, and more. Fully loaded with the fruits of our labour, we make our return back to base under a swift sunset. Union James is slower than an asthmatic hippo, so it's late into the evening before we arrive. Not being the fastest method in order to gather as much metal as we're going to need, I decide to set out the next morning on the raft to gather more essential resources for the team. We head out the next morning with Harvester the Yankee and to gather some more essential resources. Flowers. This will annoy the beavers and Chunking Cat will eat the beavers. Cementing paste and pearls are also useful items we're going to need. We return to our favourite place, where once stood our base, the walls telling a story of our triumph and glory, and now bare, no longer our home. This space belongs to the herbivores now, but here we shall find some important resources to strengthen our cause. Having once again making a successful trip to stoke the forge with raw metal, I was feeling like a change of atmosphere. Tribe members Vexing Cat and Achilles suggested making a quick journey to the artifact of the Hunter Cave, and for the sake of this commentary, we'll blame them. The loot was quite often inadequate, and the RNG gods were against us, but our sharp eyes and persistence paid off when we spotted a level 140 Megalania. We were unsuccessful in our efforts to tame the creature, even though we told it we would change the name of the tribe from the complete crew to the people's kibble. A reference to a dispute about needing more extraordinary kibble. When Vex was told she couldn't take all of the kibble that we had, she replied, but it's the people's kibble. But even with the promise of unlimited kibble, the creature decided to drown itself. Perhaps the sheer amount of trank darts that hit it while it was sleeping peacefully out of the way convinced it that it had grown gills and could breathe underwater or the fact that the tribe would forever be known as the people's kibble if it joined our cause. We witnessed a very stubborn lizard drown itself. We collected the artifacts we could while we was there, and perhaps feeling like we shouldn't return to base entirely empty-handed, we decided to journey to the artifact of the massive cave. This cave may offer some more challenge to veteran survivors like myself and Vexing Cat, and perhaps the loot gods would smile upon us and grant the tribe that all-important recipe needed to defeat the Overseer. Two teachers in the art of survival working in perfect harmony, demonstrating skill and knowledge without fear and the ability to move quickly and easily is a sight to behold. We discover loot, but it's not what we need. We both continue putting forth the effort to succeed in our task, and our endeavours yield another artefact, Vexing Cat demonstrating the confidence and sheer tenacity needed to get the job done effectively. While we wait for a second artifact to respawn, disaster hits. Perhaps a temporary mental lapse or brief period for one who grows older hits Vexing Cat, 
and she's unable to remember the combination of run and jump. Go back. You can make it. Oh no! Myself and Mr. Whippy, the Baryonyx I borrowed off Romeo earlier on, can only watch in horror as this senior moment proves to be fatal to Tribe Mate Vexing Cat. I act quickly though, and time almost slows down as the adrenaline kicks in and we attempt to save Penny. Vex is Baryonyx. Yes! Just in time. I saved Penny. Successful in saving Penny, and ready to exit the cave, the artifact respawns to tempt me into one last jump. And being that my cognitive ability to run and jump at the same time is unaffected at my age, I proceed to show how it's done. I think it's back, so... Oh, oh no, 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 I've done it too. <laughs> and I've dropped everything, including the thing. Oh, no. Failure had hit the complete crew square in the forehead. Our misjudged landings had cost the tribe a day's work, but as true winners do, we get back up. We still have the will to go on for the win. A different strategy was clearly needed, and after many hours spent by the whole crew searching for the ultimate Phylocolio, the tribe's first prototype and fully imprinted Phylos were ready for testing. So myself and tribe mate Vex travelled to Carnivore Island to power level our creatures. Once we were satisfied that our creatures were powerful enough to enter the cave of the Devourer, we set forth. Still recovering from the shock and realisation that senility and old age were creeping up on both of us. That our once perfectly timed coordination may soon be a thing of the past. Just like the old mammoths that had once roamed the island had been cast out for younger models, so too will be our fates should once again we return with less than we went out with. The newly imprinted and highly leveled Phylocolios make easy work of this cave, and despite contracting mega rabies a couple of times, we navigate the cave with ease. Come here and give me a hug. <laughs> Our endeavours in the cave prove to be successful, and fate dangles another carrot. It would seem to be a case of deja vu. A glitch in the matrix perhaps, but can this Megalania be convinced to join our cause? This creature doesn't seem to suffer with the same affliction of believing it's a fish, so we begin the training process. The creature's ability to stick to walls makes it a viable cave mount, and indeed something to be considered as an alternative to the normal. The creature also secretes a biotoxin that will be farmed for tribute items that we will need to enter the tech cave and ascend from the island map. This torpidity drops fast, so if you're attempting to tame this creature, bring plenty of narcotic. We return to the base victorious and the tribe is pleased with our new acquisition. The creature is affectionately given the name Spaghetti because it sticks to the wall and Shiny Bee places the creature above Romeo's bed. When he logs back in to discover tribe mate Vexing Cat lost his Baryonyx Mr. Whippy in the massive cave, perhaps the sight of Spaghetti stuck to his ceiling will soften the blow. Moving day. Having placed my award-winning picture of Chunk enjoying Thanksgiving on my bedroom wall, I investigate my new surroundings to find out who my neighbours are. The tribe has all expressed their artistic visions by putting their own stamps on their personal rooms. I find that tribe members who are old enough to remember when movies were good express messages of love thy neighbour and togetherness. And I'm sure it's no coincidence that the millennials among us have a less inclusive and tolerant message. Perhaps I'm old fashioned, but books like Fifty Shades of Grey and the deaths of our pop culture icons like Luke Skywalker and He-Man are starting to take its toll on our younger generation. They no longer desire masculinity or honour, and a vision of aspiring to be the perfect gentleman is old and redundant. A more submissive and less dominant male than myself may have a place in their new world, but like my father before me, I remain the gentleman and lead by example. Even if my fate is to walk so alone, I do so with my head held high. No longer is it the case that behind every great man stands a great woman, or perhaps one who just asks for permission. And it was then that I realised that I was going to spend the rest of my life with him. Trust me lads, don't go in there. <laughs> we set sail on tribe mate Stone Cold's impenetrable motorboat of death, and enjoy some homemade sandwiches courtesy of tribe mate Chunk. 
The three of us are enjoying a leisurely cruise only to discover that the sheer hypocrisy and hubris of the younger generation strikes again. It would seem that tribe mate Shiny B has snuck into my room in the middle of the night to tattoo my forehead with her name. Oh, Shiny. <laughs> She's in trouble, but... It's clear that the millennials make up their own rules, and because of this clear overstep of boundaries, I'm left once again feeling like the potential in the younger recruits to learn the ways of the gentleman is without a hope. Are we living on an island together where one has to worry about locking their doors and windows at night before going to sleep? Has the decision to allow each tribe mate their own space been a mistake? And is it a case of possession and acquisition leading to a more complacent mindset amongst our younger tribe mates? Perhaps we should punish such behaviour by giving them less so they contribute more. A thought I shall ponder on, and a Jedi would never take revenge. But dissent among a tribe cannot be tolerated. And should the complete crew be successful in its efforts to complete the island map, then it will need to work as a team and not as an individual. There is an admin command we can use to give players big heads, and perhaps both taking their own space away from them, and by taking their beauty. Perhaps we will teach them both empathy and respect for a person's space in the tribe. A debate we will leave to the next council meeting, and should we decide to kick the younger members out, I will in fact be able to expand my room into Blues who's moved in next door to me, should we decide to stick all of the younger members in a smaller dormitory. I also have reason to suspect that tribe member Blue is conducting an illegal operation next door to my own bedroom. He even had the audacity to rob my electricity, with no regard for the ugly wiring that was left protruding through the centre of my bedroom. If the rumours are true that the next Walter White has indeed taken up residence next to myself, then it's yet more reason to address perhaps building a school somewhere out in a swamp to isolate the younger members from the rest of the tribe. Myself and tribe mates Vex and Stone Cold tackle the artefact of the Brute Cave with little difficulty, grabbing both experience, loot and the artefacts needed, but also conducting a science experiment on whether it's possible to tame an underwater cave creature if it's under level 150. The question as to why some creatures can be tamed and some can't is a mystery. I suspect that the other underwater cave falls into this category, and being that the artefact of the strong cave has polar bears and yetis, I suspect it applies there too. When we return to the base, I spend the next 30 minutes trying to remove the paint from my forehead. I try everything from taking a shower and dunking my head in the kitchen sink, but I eventually resort to asking tribe mates Vex and Marleybeg to wash me in the front entrance. When I eventually figure out how to remove the stamp from my forehead, I go to bed feeling like I was violated. Before I go to sleep that night, I wonder if my constant need to go for a crap every five minutes in front of other tribe members is a direct result of tribe mate Chunks Element Dust Sandwiches or Shiny Bee's Paintbrush. <laughs> I've never used soap, no. Uh, I mean, I've used it to make, you know, to make pollen last, rather than it, but, and I've used it to remove stuff on thingy, but how do you remove it off your face? The next time I'm able to log onto the server, I'm fortunate enough to do so at a time when a large part of the tribe is going out to do the artifact of the Cunning Cave. A tricky underwater cave as I demonstrated in my Gen 2 Island Note mini-series when I underestimated the cave and lost Attila, my Baryonyx. The group showed me an ability I'd totally forgotten about on the Basilosaurus, where it can blow water and make a rainbow, and we all take some screenshots. I'm pleased I was able to join the group here. As all jokes aside, one of the main reasons I encouraged Vexing Cat, my server admin, to organise all of this for the community was for new and old players to learn some new skills. But for the people that do have family, work and study still feel like they have a place in the tribe. It's moments like this that encapsulate why it's fun to play a great game like this with others. I found myself telling more than capable members of the group how to do the cave like I'm a master. I would like to say to all of the people that have been part and continue to be part of this tribe that jumping onto Discord and hearing my friend Vexing Cat laugh genuinely and sincerely at you lot brings warm feelings to my cold heart and hearing and seeing you lot all have fun is genuinely what this is all about. One of the best things about doing YouTube is reading a comment on one of my videos saying I made someone's day a little bit more bearable. But the friends I've made through the community and Discord is something I treasure just as much and I feel I can't take all of the credit for that without giving thanks to both Vex and everybody who's been part of this. 
I demonstrate the best way I feel to get to the artifact by dropping just low enough to bring the creatures out of the small entrance so all the players can surround them. Inside that hole it's very tight and it's very easy to get trapped and all it takes is a couple of alpha sharks boosting everything and it will make short work of an imprinted bassy. We carry on to gather any remaining loot and grab all of the explorer notes. The first time I explored this cave I couldn't find the artifact but I like the fact that it was hidden halfway through. Jaybird was the only member who fought to grab a land dino but the five of us were equipped enough to deal with the few bats and spiders that roam the tops here. On the journey back to the base we encountered both Alpha Mosas and Tussos which will provide the tribe with the essential Alpha tributes that are needed. The tribe is starting to gather some good fishing poles as well so I'd like to experiment with loot gathering and fishing soon. The tribe has manifested a roster of different creatures it will attempt to use to defeat the guardians of the island map. Rexes, Megatheriums, Thenos and Utes are all being selectively bred to become powerful enough to take into battle. And work is well on the way to gather all the resources needed to craft both the guns and saddles for the final fight. While I'm hatching my Uteranus egg, tribe mate Romeo proudly shows me his new favourite creature he affectionately calls Glob. He plans to sneak about the base scaring other tribe members and shooting the white sticky substance that the creature secretes all over unsuspecting players and hiding in dark corners. I agree that various members of the tribe will enjoy being globbed on by his new spider and that he should also carry on boosting the morale of the tribe with glob while I continue to imprint my new Uteranus. Oh dear. <laughs> well there goes glob. Today we will see a significant portion of the tribe tackle both the snow caves. It's important that each member of the crew gathers at least one artifact to get the achievement personally retrieved all artifacts. The tribe will do multiple boss runs and we will need them. To truly complete Ark, each cave must be attempted. The first cave we attempt holds the artifact of the Skylord. Several members make short work of the bats and spiders here and the tribe is rewarded with a few more artifacts. The Skylord cave is relatively easy and being that it's one of the cave artifacts needed to fight the dragon, it's unnecessary to gather more than we need. Again it's an opportunity for members that haven't personally retrieved the artifact to do so as no member of this group can join the top 5% of art players and complete the game without personally retrieving all of the artifacts. Our adventure is fruitful and the tribe heads back to the base to collect our new UTs that we all leveled and allowed to heal in the meantime. On the way back the tribe gathers more metal from the mining site that's been set up at the Blue Obelisk. With a very rich resource of metal nodes surrounding the Blue Obelisk, a leveled Anki and 30 minutes of gathering amounts to a bountiful haul. Each metal ingot will be used in our efforts to chip away at the daunting task of resources to craft all of the saddles. With the tribe carrying as much metal back to base and collecting the Uteranuses, they head on out towards the artifact of the Strong Cave. The tribe gathers in the entrance to the Strong Cave and they've chosen Uteranuses as the cave dinosaur used to tackle what some consider the hardest cave on the island map. Their ability to fear roar all the Parlovia out of the ground makes this a very strong cave dino and even though several members do make short work of a cave, this is a great option to solo the cave with and in combination with a UT and a couple of aloes would make soloing the cave a lot easier. There is always many ways to skin a cat in Ark Survival Evolved but it would seem that the Uteranus definitely trumps this cave. While in the cave it makes sense to grab as many artifacts as possible and as much loot as some of the better loot can also spawn in this cave. An otter and some good fur gear is recommended to tackle this cave with. It is said that there is no bad weather, only inappropriate clothing. So all who enter the cave of the strong should equip fur clothing and an otter and pump at least 20 points of fortitude. I even noticed my fellow tribe mates farting snowflakes if that's not an indication as to how cold this cave can be. While in the cave it makes sense to grab as many artifacts as possible and as much loot as some of the better loot can also spawn in this cave. With a new day comes new chance and opportunity. Whilst out on my rounds to spot any dino we haven't already tamed that could prove useful, I spy a Giga. They say that success is not only in the hand, it's in the heart. And the heart of the Giga is another piece of the key that we need to open the tech cave and ascend from the island. 
vexing cat volunteers to go gigger fishing, and largely unprepared, we attempt to bring the gigger down to the ocean. For why fight something that strong when it can drown just like anything else that walks the land? Our attempts to lead the beast to the ocean are unsuccessful, but it gets cornered in a ravine and we throw all the bullets we have at it. And the gigger is about to succumb to its wounds when it eats a stego and regains full health. We fail to kill the Beast King and lose this battle. But defeat can only come to those who can admit it, and Tribe Mate Vexing Cat vows to pull the creature's heart out with her own hands. A resupply and this time I construct a trap that's supposed to snare the Gigger easily. I place a trap but I fail to snare the beast and in our attempts to lure it into the trap, the King of Beasts gets stuck behind a rock. The Gigger attempts to fly away from its position but we strike the creature with all the power we have. Endless shotgun blasts of the creature's head prove fatal and Tribe Mate Vex claims her heart. Tribe mates Romeo and Jaybird have been building an army that will take on all of the island bosses and they really have come up with a unique system for stacking mutations without the use of mods. And in this playthrough the tribe has had to think outside of the box to get this stuff done fast. And the results speak for themselves as they have made perhaps the greatest production line ever seen in Ark Survival Evolved and it really does deserve a video dedicated to how efficient this production line is. Today the island crew will be facing off against all of the island bosses and doing our first run. Our first fight will be against the Broodmother and we will be taking Rexes into our first fight. Each Rex has about 8 mutations and around 30k's worth of health and they're stacking around 500 melee damage. Of course each one has an ascendant saddle. The Art of War by Sun Tzu states, if you know neither your enemy nor yourself you will succumb in every battle. War is a part of life and it's in the nature of most living organisms to win, to dominate. And our first battle begins with the Broodmother, a giant spider that spits a devastating poison at its foes and summons more minions to its cause. Brute force is an incorrect strategy here. High health and the ability to soak damage is the best tactics. After establishing a good surround on the Broodmother with our Rexes, I use the Uteranus to courage raw each one. Megatheriums have also been bred for this fight and would be a great option. They may look like giant sloths but they are literally the island's insect killer. And when fighting insects including the Broodmother, they enter an enraged state that makes them almost unstoppable. But for the first fight against the Alpha Broodmother, the complete crew has chosen the classic T-Rex. Each member has of course imprinted their own T-Rex. This means a rider will take 30% less incoming damage and also deal an extra 30% outgoing damage. Having a full imprint on any creature gives it an extra 20% increase to all of its stats regardless of having a rider so it's critical to beat in this game. I myself act as the support class on the back of a Uteranus and fully coverage roared each Rex will gain an additional 25% damage and a reduction of 20% incoming damage. Again, the key to beating Ark is in breeding. A whole list of tech engrams are unlocked upon defeating the Broodmother and the complete crew are successful and unlock the engrams for both the tech helmet and boots but it's the trophies that we will need to enter the final fight. Our next foe will require more focus. Sun Tzu would say the highest form of warfare is to attack strategy itself, to ensure our own invulnerability and to wait for the enemy's vulnerability. The key here is to wait for your opponent to make a mistake and exploit it. The Megapithecus wants us to come to him Face him on the high ground where the team is vulnerable and can easily be knocked off the side of the bridge. So tribe mate Jaybird volunteers to aggravate the beast and brings the fight to a place where we can all get a good surround on the creature. Once again I play a support role on the Uteranus, courage roaring all of the Rexes. The key to beating the giant monkey lies in having high health and soaking the damage. Sun Tzu distinguishes nine types of battlegrounds in the art of war. If the ground is strategically advantageous to either side then it must be exploited. 
The Megapithecus is easily triggered and its recklessness is its biggest weakness. We make short work of the Megapithecus and this time each member of the complete crew opens the tech gauntlets Ingram and we all defeat the Ark's second ultimate life form. But to defeat Ark's third guardian, the complete crew will need a new strategy. The Phenoxenosaurus is often overlooked as a boss fighting creature, but I think in this case my fellow co-creator Bunner says it best. Over to you, my man. Athena, she's the goddess of sex. Like Gillette, she's the best that a man can get. Okay. Forget the other deities, for she's the almighty. Straight up stripping the title from that imposter Aphrodite. Athena, she's the bringer of death. Even Thanatos trembles at the sound of her breath. The other dinosaurs just call her Santa Claus, forever coated in red and always... Bringing the claws. The island's final guardian is the dragon, a creature that dwarfs both the Broodmother and the Megapithecus and is by far the hardest guardian to defeat on the island map. A strategy is required here and the complete crew has opted for the Thenos, a herbivore so perhaps it can be overlooked as a good potential boss killer, but to increase its ability to heal in combat, each creature is given 10 veggie cakes. When a herbivore consumes a sweet veggie cake, it will restore 10% of its health over 30 seconds. And this particular group of fairies has roughly 13 mutations, and has largely been stacked in melee damage. Each creature has roughly 20k health and almost 1k in damage, which is almost double the melee damages of our current rexes. Glass cannons are the key to beating the dragon, as regardless of the creature's health, the dragon's fire breath will deal 20% of anything's maximum health, as well as doing some direct damage. Brute force is the key to winning this fight. Tribe mate Vexing Cat has been given the role of directing this fight, and will certainly have the hardest job. A Uteranus is literally only a couple of hits away from death at any time in this arena. Even with a good ascendant saddle, she must do her best to avoid being hit and ready to jump on a ferry should the creature take too much damage. Since the introduction of Genesis Part 1, the Magmasaur has become the go-to creature on official service for this fight, but the complete crew will not be using exploits to jump maps and has to deal with what's available on each map. The Magmasaur is invulnerable to both lava and its fire breath and is a creature that is available on the fantastic mod map for Jorah. A map that I personally can't wait to play and I look forward to facing the dragon on there. But the complete crew will have to use the cards that's been dealt on the island map. The dragon summons minions to its side in the form of hostile Pteranodons and Dimorphodons. So each member is bought in their best armor along with medical brews and Kalian soup. Another old but popular exploit is Wyvern Milk, as this will make the dinos and players invulnerable to its breath for a short time. But just as I've done in my personal playthrough, the complete crew can only use what's available on each map, and no dinos or ingrams that are available on other maps can be used here. We go into battle only with the items and tames that are available on each map. We're all aware how much easier this game would be to complete if we could jump maps and grab different dinosaurs. Even the use of mods like S Plus or Unlock All Ingrams makes Ark a far easier game to complete, so the true completionist must only use what's available here. Roughly halfway through the fight, tribe mate Vexing Cat has to abandon her Uteranus and jump on a ferry. Like water, the enemy changes all the time, and Sun Tzu encourages us to derive victory from our changing circumstances. It's then that the dragon gets stuck and the complete crew uses the situation to our advantage dismounting our creatures to fire our shotguns. The final blows come from the creatures itself, as it can glitch out if the final hit comes from a player. And of course, the final piece of tech armor is unlocked. Once again, the complete crew give a masterclass on how to defeat Ark's guardians. We lose one UT and one ferry, but mid-fight we was able to recover the ferry saddle. And even though the UT perished in the lava at the end, his saddle was disposable and unable to be reached. 
The complete crew is now ready to take on the island's final test, the Tech Cave. It's all come down to this. Over the last couple of weeks, the complete crew has been working together to complete the final test, the Tech Cave. Having completed both Gamma and Beta Overseer, the complete crew take on the island's final trial, the Alpha Tech Cave. Things get off to a slightly shaky start, with tribe mate Jaybird getting stuck in the entrance before any of the members have been able to enter the cave. And it's imperative that we sort out this jam as quickly as possible. The tech cave door is only open for five minutes, and we need to get as many dinos through this door as quickly as possible. The complete crew is using both T-Rexes and Thenos to enter the tech cave with. These are the same creatures that we've been facing the island's ultimate bosses with, and hopefully we have everything we need to face the Overseer. The complete crew has got the tactics down to a fine art, and it's imperative that the members at the front clear the way so that the members at the back can slowly make their way down the tech cave. Despite the hiccup at the start of getting into the cave, all members are able to enter unhindered, and it's the job of the tribe members at the front to clear the way for the rest of the train to make its way down the tech cave. Tribe mate Shiny comes in from the rear to back up the front crew, and of course she's not leading any dinosaurs, so she runs in to help out at the front. Everything seems to be going to plan, and the crew continue down the winding path. The complete crew reaches its first waypoint at the bottom of the cave. There's also a good sniper position, and sometimes you are able to spot a Giga and perhaps kite it into the lava. Perhaps the most awkward thing about completing the tech cave is often the Gigas that can spawn here. And the last thing you want is to lose any of your creatures before the fight ends. And it is on this run that we actually run into our first Giga. It's of course small steps to add up to complete the big journey. Tribe mate Romeo successfully manages to get a shot on the Giga and kites it into the lava, dispatching our first Giga without any trouble. So we continue on down the path, making good time. But it's here that we run into our first obstacle. The second Giga in the tech cave has spawned in a very awkward position, just above the bridge. To make sure that we save our creatures, the complete crew makes a backup, and we turn round so we can get away from the front of the pack. The last thing the complete crew wants to do is battle the Giga in an awkward place. As always, it's a case of bring the fight to us. It's just then that tribe mate Vexing Cat makes a serious misjudgment. Rather than coming round the outside with the rest of the crew, she tried to turn in an awkward place, and her T-Rex falls into the lava. It's here that I decide to dismount my T-Rex and jump off to see if I can assist in whistling and perhaps saving any of the creatures that have fallen into the lava. The T-Rex is rescued and we need to get out the Ferrazinos, but it's at this moment that I trigger the Parlovia. It's quite unfortunate that I didn't see this one earlier and of course it costs the tribe dearly. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, oh. <laughs> There's a pile over you there. <laughs> oh, dear. A new day and a new mindset. No matter how strong our resolve, sometimes we all get frustrated and want to give up. Whether that happens at work, training for a big race or even in a relationship, there are times when you most need encouragement. But we must persist, and our character consists of not what we do on our first try, but it's our third and fourth tries. Winners never quit, and quitters never win. Once again, the complete crew enters the tech cave on alpha mode, this time attempting to complete the tech cave with the members that haven't ascended from the island map, which would include myself this time round. We managed to enter the tech cave largely without any hiccups, but this time around the Giga spawns in a completely different place. These next shots come from tribe member Achilles. On our beta run he sacrificed himself from the team, and we all learned a new tactic. For Frodo. Gee, go for it mate. Achilles, yes, I love you. 
<laughs> Go for it. Oh my god. Go for One for the team. Go for it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> run, run, run. Run right off the cliff. Huh? Run off the cliff, he'll probably go into lava. Yeah. And then you can just head down to the next part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just get through. He can't, he oh, can't follow oh, you through oh, the. Oh, oh, oh. He just pushed me to the lava. <laughs> oh, no. No See uh -oh. if you can swim out. Swim out toward the gate down there. Okay. Yeah. Come on, come on, come on. I'm stuck. You can make. Oh my god. Oh. Oh. A big shout out to Tribe Mate Achilles for sharing his screen. He took one for the team on the Beta Tech Cave run, but this time the tribe has a different method, and we've brought in some sacrificial lambs. Once again, we'll cut back to Achilles, and we've got some Megatheriums to do just the job. Instead of sacrificing one of the members of the team, we've brought in a sacrificial creature. Yeah. Oh, there you go. There you go. There you go. A bit more, a bit more. Yeah, almost. Hey, what? There we <laughs> go. There we go. Oh, look at that, guys. That's amazing. Okay. That yeah. official line. <laughs> the tactic worked perfectly, and the Giga falls for it and follows our Megatherium into the lava. So we continue on down to the Tech Cave Gate with plenty of time remaining. We make it to the last corner and the last hurdle. Everything seems to be going according to plan, but unfortunately, somehow an Allosaurus managed to jump back up and kite Tribe Mate Jaybird's T Rex into the lava. It'd be a great shame if Tribe Mate Jaybird loses his favourite T Rex. So we do everything we can to stop it from melting in the lava. Fortunately, his T-Rex is strong enough. It may not be able to fight the Overseer and we'll have to pod it up for the main fight. But we are able to save it and we all enter the tech cave. Different tactics need to be used in order to complete this. In my solo run, it's all very well to be able to use an otter to be able to stave off the ice cold. But this time round, each creature counts for something. And if each member of the tribe was to try and take in an otter to stave off the cold, then we would only have 10 creatures left to fight the overseer. This is why all tribe members are using fire curries and we've all bought in good fur armour to stave off the cold to make sure that we've not got that debuff during the fight. So it's all come down to this, the tribe's hard work and we're at the final hurdle. The Overseer is the final boss on the island map. It summons minions in the form of attack drones and defence units and these units will drop some element on the ground. It changes forms periodically during the fight representing all of the Ark's guardians from the Megapithecus, Broodmother and the Dragon. Its appearance is reminiscent of the specimen implant, having characteristics of the shapes of its diamond, and it transforms into each of the guardians. According to the lore of Ark, the AI of the Overseer experiments with the survivors on the station, and it ultimately decides who can continue and ascend to a higher evolutionary chain, and who will be terminated. It tends to all life on the Ark until the signal calls it down to Earth to terraform Earth back to normal. The complete crew is more than a match for the Overseer, and we end up completing the Ark. Right now I'm going to put all of the names of the members who managed to see it all through to the end. Each one can take pride in the fact that we managed to do this largely without any mods. For those of you who are wondering, we only took a stack mod and the spyglass mod. We also used a role playing storage mod where we're going to consider dropping these mods for our next mission. Should all of the members reassemble, we will continue on to Scorched Earth and complete all of these maps individually. A huge thank you to all of the tribe members that managed to see this through to the end. It's been good fun revisiting the island map and completing the game in a different way. Working together as a tribe is how the game was initially intended to be completed. I just want to say a huge thank you to all of the names scrolling up the screen right now. 
These are the members of the complete crew who managed to ascend from the island map. Of course, quite a few more members started, but only these members managed to make it in the end. You managed to complete the game largely in a way that it was intended. I'll finish by saying it's been great fun to complete this as a team. And of course, Ark Survival Evolved was always intended to be a team-based game. And I think it's appropriate that the final thing we do is leave you with the final cutscene of our ascension. So until next time, I'm James from Complete Games and I'll see you.